I'm Shannon Weber with the Bay Area Perinatal Aid Center here with, you want to introduce yourself? And I'm Dazon Dixon Jallo here with Shannon. We're at the International AIDS Conference in Malvern. Mm -hmm. We just had a really interesting session yesterday about PrEP um, for women that use drugs, sex workers, trans women, and it really got us talking about this important topic. Yes. Which is the language that we use right. around a risk and risk perception. So in the U.S., we now have some really pretty decent guidelines about PrEP. Um, in those, though, they refer to women being at risk or high risk. Mm -hmm. um, tell me what you think about that. Well, what's interesting, I think, first of all, that the fact that PrEP has come along, and, and I think we should contextualize why we even want to parse out whether people are at risk or not around PrEP. Mm -hmm. And that's simply because, really, you have to have some heightened sense around the transmission of HIV in your own life if you're going to be considering taking a pill every day. Mm -hmm. And so I think that putting that in that kind of context meant that we were driven by this language to de define who should have PrEP, who should be offered PrEP, who should be considering getting on PrEP, who mm -hmm. should we even be paying for PrEP for if they're mm -hmm. not able mm -hmm. to afford it. And so we start compartmentalizing populations based on the epidemic and we start calling them high risk. Mm -hmm. And what happens for me, though, is that risk is fluid. Mm -hmm. It changes. People talk about seasons of fluid. I talk about the ebb and uh, seasons of risk, and I talk about the ebb and flow mm -hmm. of risk versus vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Because in my head, risk means you're taking a decision, and you are acting on that decision to mm -hmm. engage in something that may be riskier mm -hmm. than not. Mm -hmm. But there are also conditions. There are environments, there's structures, there's things like stigma, there's things like if I'm transgender, there's all kinds of phobias about that, mm -hmm. that actually put me in a box of no decision making, right? Right. So how am I actively engaging in risk As if versus there was a choice? Exactly. Yeah. So in my head, I think that anyone, and we should be able to say this very clearly, and I want to make a comment about the guidelines too, but we should say this very clearly. That if you are sexually active, mm -hmm. you are at risk, mm -hmm. right? Especially if you are not using condoms or other methods of protection mm -hmm. or other types of sex that don't transmit fluids, mm -hmm. right? That I think could we would say the same thing about pregnancy, by the way. Exactly. If you wanted it, for women, right. we would say if you're not using a form right. of birth control, you are at risk of becoming pregnant. And do we decide which women are at greater risk for pregnancy or not before we offer them oral contraceptives? Mm -hmm. No. It's a matter of today, I get to decide. Today, I think that I am more vulnerable. I have a heightened opportunity mm -hmm. because of what's going on in my life, whether it's my decisions or whether it's things that's happening to me, mm -hmm. that at a given moment, and I have a heightened sense that I am at risk, then I should know about PrEP. I should know about all my prevention options. Mm -hmm. A Couple of weeks from now, everything might be different. Mm -hmm. May not even be having any kind of sex. So am I still at risk? No. Mm -hmm. So there's a way to get folks to identify the, again, the conditions that they're in, what's happening in their lives in that moment mm -hmm. to determine whether they are at risk or not. And I think an individual gets to determine whether it's high. Mm -hmm. I love that. What do you think we can do, those of us who want to contribute to moving this conversation forward, about shifting our own language? As we talk about it with each other, as people give presentations, maybe yes. they're writing a blog post, maybe they're talking about it at their family dinner. How can we move that conversation forward and shifting our language so that it's um, more inclusive and more inviting. Right, and there's not going to be a sound bite, mm -hmm. like a two, uh, like a hyphenated word, like high risk. Mm -hmm. But I think we should continue to acknowledge at risk, mm -hmm. and then offer, just like in the guidelines, what at risk might mean, mm -hmm. as opposed to high risk mm -hmm. might mean, because it pretty much is the same. It's just a, you know, it's a scale mm -hmm. of risk, and I think that that's what needs to be taken into consideration. The other thing about the guidelines is that, and we fought to make sure that there was some level of gender inclusivity, right? Mm -hmm. That that yep. uh, that there was that there were specific things that men and women could see of themselves in there. What about transgender people seeing themselves in the mm -hmm. guidelines? So in terms of the language, there are one of two things we could do. We can always, always say men, women, and transgendered individuals, mm -hmm. or we can always, always say men and women, including transgender women. 
So, I mean, there are ways that we can have this conversation, that we can just, it doesn't take monumental shifts. A tiny shift. It makes, it takes mm. conscious shifts mm. in how we're thinking about people in the context of their lives and not how we're thinking about people as vectors of disease. Mm. I love that. Thank you so much for all that you do to move biomedical prevention methods for women forward and to make sure that women are included in that conversation. I know that you go above and beyond. And it's really appreciated. Well, feeling is mutual. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jen. Mm -hmm. mm. Good. We'll be a little